and so on, uh, and so on, and so on. My next point, so let's go further. Uh, another, and then maybe I can stop so that we don't go too far or how. Just one point I would love to make, uh, namely uh, uh, the point about, uh, sorry, uh, the point about uh, structure of power. Uh, how is power, how, this is I think an extremely interesting phenomenon, namely, uh, how does authority function today? Because I think this is part of this democratic game of, you know, we are all self-entrepreneurs and so on. Here I refer to the work of Alenka Zupancic and some other of my Lacanian colleagues in Slovenia. Traditional power works in a fetishist way, in the sense of you may know personally that that guy who embodies power is an idiot like you, but if he has the proper insignia, then when he speaks power, the law speaks through him. It's this fetishist logic of what in psychoanalysis we call uh, we call uh, uh, we call symbolic castration like uh, uh, for example uh, socrates when he was condemned to death no his point is basically i know those judges who condemned me are idiots but nonetheless they are legal power law speaks through them so it's this je sais bien mais quand même i know very well but i know very well you are an idiot like me but nonetheless through you a higher authority act. So, okay, what I claim is that today, and this is maybe the big result of 68, 60s rebellion, and how this rebellion was reappropriated in a triumphant way by ruling ideology. Today, costumes, masks, this insignia of power are no longer uh, no longer necessary. Today, power, uh, that, okay, I'll put it in this way. How does a typical, typical, not all of them, of course, boss act today? It's no longer insisting on this dignity and so on. It's more like, listen, I'm the same guy like you, let's be equal. You know, a typical boss today, I don't know, you come on Monday to the job, he, kicks you, did you have a good sex, a nice, or, or, you know, like, we are the colleagues displaying the same weaknesses as, as you, but the paradox is all this not only in no way undermines his or her power, it makes it even stronger. The paradox is that uh, the boss, the leader, authority, whatever, is allowed, as we say in psychoanalytic jargon, to display his castration, make fun of himself, ridiculous guy, weak, and so on and so on. And this in no way limits his power, but makes it, makes it in a way even more absolute. In what sense? Uh, uh, because I claim that when you have this egalitarian boss, the oppression is even worse. Because it's not so much that there is no herrschaft, domination, but that domination itself becomes unspeakable. What do I mean by this? Once I had a debate with uh, uh, Judith Butler, who I think was here a couple of times in Vienna, you know her, and we have many, I had many polemics with her, but at one point I agree with her, where uh, she said that the most dangerous oppression, I simplify her argument, on women is not when they are directly oppressed, but when they are de facto oppressed, but this is masked by a superficial, oh, but we are the same, you know, like, false spirit of fraternal equality and so on and so on. So she had a wonderful proposal. She said that in such a situation, the most subversive gesture of a woman is to demand men to act as a master. Like, you are de facto master, so don't give me this bullshit that we are all equal. Give me orders, and this is the way to maybe to 
undermine domination. In what way? Let me return to the beginning to our beloved Stalinism. An example that I always like to use, a fictional example. Let's say we are in Moscow, 1935. Let's say to be modest, you are a central committee, I am Stalin. Uh, somebody has to be. I give a big speech, you applaud, you know, you applaud, I applaud, and so on. Then we have a debate. One of you attacks me. Uh, uh, next day, probably the big debate will be who has seen that guy alive in the last, no. But, ah, now that's not all. Let's say then that another of you stands up and starts to shout at this first guy who attacked me. Are you crazy? We don't do this here. We don't attack Comrade Stalin. I claim the second guy would disappear even faster. You see the point? It wasn't only prohibited to criticize Stalin. It was even more prohibited to publicly announce this prohibition. It's not only that Stalin was the master, but if you say this, you were, well, you disappeared or whatever. So this paradox I find so fascinating. And here we learn so much about how ideology works, about how, uh, okay, we have relations of domination, but precisely the word domination is a domination which in which you, if you are the dominated one, you have to pretend as if, act as if there is no domination. I could go on here. There are many paradoxes here, uh, which are not abstract theoretical paradoxes, but determine our daily life. Like one of the basic ideological mechanisms, and this tells a lot about the freedom of choice, is that, to put it brutally, you are given the freedom of choice on one condition, that you make the right choice, you know. And now you will say, this is crazy. No, I think this is maybe even the fundamental feature of our uh, symbolic universe, in a way. Look, don't you have these rituals? I repeat now some of my old topics. Don't you have these rituals? For example, let's say you are rich, I am poor. You invite me to dinner. And although we all know in advance that you will pay, but there is, at least in my country, I think, which, a ritual that I have when the bill arrives, I have to insist a little bit, no, 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 let me pay. And then we play this game for, I mean, if you really hate me, you should say, okay, pay. No, then. But uh, you see, but it's too easy to say that this is a hypocrisy. This is how politeness works. And at this level, ideology at its most elementary enters. I hope you don't know it, there is a story which was told to me by a friend of mine when he served military service, when he did his military service decades ago in old Yugoslavia. I don't know how it is in your army, but now you don't know. When you still had conscript army, with Yugoslavia it was like this, probably most of the armies. Once you are there uh, in the army, for some two weeks you have elementary training and there the big moment uh, uh, arrives where all of you are gathered there, you repeat the pledge, I am red, blah, blah, and then you sign your name in some book and you are a soldier now. Okay, what a friend of a friend of mine, this friend of mine was just there, saw this, did is something ingenious. After this ceremony, when he had to sign the book, he approached the officer and said, I don't want to sign it. And the officer told him, are you crazy? You will be arrested. Then my fr my, the friend of my friend told him, but wait a minute, are you ordering me to sign it or is this a free pledge? Officer told him, of course it's free, free decision. Then the guy said, but if it's free, why should I sign it then and so on. So they got engaged in a paradox, and at the end, my, the friend of my friend got a paper, I have a photocopy, where this officer gave him a written statement claiming that he, the officer, is ordering him, the soldier, is ordering him to freely sign the oath. I think, again, you have this mechanism at the very beginning, and uh, 
I think we should do all these studies today if we want to get at how we are controlled today. For example, another story that I repeated 10, 20 times of how this permissivity can be even worse oppression. Imagine that you are a small boy, it's Sunday afternoon, your father wants you to visit your grandmother, and you hate it, of course. You would prefer to play with friends. If you have a traditional patriarchal father, everything is okay. No, the father will simply tell you, listen, I don't care how you feel, it's your duty to do it, do it and behave properly. If this happens, everything is okay. You will rebel, you will become a normal uh, young guy, okay. But now enters the monster called postmodern permissive father. What does he do? Uh, uh, he does something like this. I know because I experienced this. He tells you, you are free to go or not. But please be aware of how much your grandmother loves you and misses you and so on. So you know what he is really telling you? He is subtly not just ordering you to go, but he is ordering you to go voluntarily, to freely go. You know, this is the true terror. Not just you have to do it, but you have to want to do it. I, and I think, again, mechanisms like that are absolutely crucial today. This is what, I'm sorry, we don't have time, more time to go into this because this is, I think, so fundamental. That's why if there is an era that I remember as a pure paradise, it was my military service. No, I'm not crazy. No, precisely I was shocked, disappointed. In my psychological structure, I'm kind of a fascist probably. I like discipline and order. And what shocked me in the army was how, it's not really like that, at least Yugoslav army. Beneath the discipline and order, there is an obscure domain of obscene jokes, perversions, and so on. And it took me a long time to guess how. There is nothing subversive in these jokes. They are absolutely crucial for the military discipline to reproduce itself. You know, and then more and more I'm convinced that every institution has something like this. For example, in the United States, the top colleges, you know, you have all these fraternities, sororities with their obscene rituals and so on. In Yugoslav military, ah, another thing fascinated me. This is what my gay friends don't like to hear. Officially, officially, publicly, the army was extremely brutally homophobic. And it really meant it. If a soldier was discovered to be gay, he was every night, be nobody dared to talk to him. He was usually every night beaten, you know, the standard ritual. Somebody pulls, puts a, a, a pillow on your head and others beat you with their belts and so on. Okay, you will say, okay, ah, it's not so simple. Because at the same time, the entire army life was penetrated by homosexual innuendos and so on. I remember, for example, in my unit, uh, when you met your friend in the morning, you didn't say good morning, you say, you say smoke mine. This was an euphemism for fellatio, you know. Like it was every, I could give you dozens of it. So you know what fascinates me so much that no power structure can reproduce it's, you, you need what I call inherent transgression. Apparent dirty transgressions, which may appear even subversive, but they are a uh, part of the game. They are crucial for the reproduction of power structure. So why is this so important today? Because I think that today, uh, the official public structure is more and more egalitarian. Yes, but relations of domination survive at this implicit, obscene, unspoken level. You know, this secret, like, when do you really admit something? When do you really belong to a community, from the nation to a family? It's not enough just to follow the explicit rules. It's also to know how and when to violate these rules. I think uh, 
community is never defined, any communal body, just by the explicit rules. You not only ha this is why people who to learn manners go, but nobody cares about it today. You know, when I was still young, you had this uh, 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 people who taught you good manners so that you know how to behave in high class society. And it always fails. Why? Because they taught you the rules, but they didn't teach you how to violate the rules. You are really a member of a community if you know all these implicit rules of which rules are you to take seriously, which rules you have to violate, how. For example, there are rules which are meant to be transgressed, especially in sexuality. When, for example, in traditional patriarchal sexuality, when father tells you not to mix with girls, it's really a call, do it discreetly, and so on and so on. Uh, there are many rules like this, which just, you know, this is the St. Paul, Paul Bible dimension of you need prohibition to generate your desire and so on. But much more interesting for me is the opposite example. Not when something is prohibited, but the message of the law is to do it, but when something you are permitted, even solicited to do it, you know, that you are given a freedom on condition that you don't use it. So if I may conclude with a story from my youth, I wasn't a big dissident, I was a half dissident. And I remember when I was young, I was in a student journal and we were, there were elections. Now, in ex-Yugoslavia, elections were not as bad as in Soviet Union. The party didn't get 99.7. They had enough about 80, 85 percent. But we knew it, no? How it was. So we at the journal asked ourselves, what should we do? Some radical idiots proposed, why don't we simply openly do a heroic gesture? Let's publish an issue of this journal where we claim these were not free elections, these were a fake, and so on. Okay, we said, but everybody knows this. What would be the point? We would just appear idiots, you know. So then one of us, not me, had an ingenious idea. Which we said, they are claiming that these are real democratic elections. So let's just treat them like that. And on the evening of elections, we published an extraordinary issue of the journal with big titles, latest election results. It looks that communists will remain in power, you know, like... And it was such a wonderful act because they were so furious at us, at the Central Committee. Not really, we didn't reach being correct. And they called us there and said, boys, don't do this, you provoke us. Then we just naively said, listen, these were free elections and we felt the duty to inform people of the result. And it was so tragic, this party bureaucrat, because she couldn't have told us, no, they were not free elections. She just said, boys, don't fuck with me. You know very well what I mean. We asked him, but what do you mean? Don't mess with me. You know, like, I almost felt the sympathy for that guy. You know, and now to really finish, because you once, when we had the last debate, asked me, where am I? Revolution, social democracy, whatever. Ah, I combined the two. No, not in some stupid, synthetic way. That's why I like Syriza. That's why I like, up to a point, it's so fashionable today to be against President Obama. He did some good things. Why? Take Obama and universal health care. It's nothing revolutionary, my God. Most of the Western liberal states have still some kind of universal health care. But in America, in the United States, it's a traumatic point. You know what happened to Obama. He was dragged up to the Supreme Court and so on. So I think the art of politics today is to formulate a specific demand, which is a very modest one. Nobody can accuse you, you want Stalinism or whatever like Obama healthcare, it's something that Canada held, but in that concrete constellation, it is extremely traumatic. You trigger a whole process. So not big demands, big demands can often be meaningless, you know. Uh, I mean, I remember this from my communist youth in communist Yugoslavia. In the last years, 
when they allowed dissidents up to a point, dissidents become a profession. These were wonderful times, you know. Communist Party financed like there was a dissident congress, anti-communist in Paris, and the government, okay, you can go there, blah, blah, we finance you the trip. The catch was just what? Don't be too concrete, you know, like, communism is worse than, than fascism. Ooh, they didn't care about that. But don't say repeal that law here in our country, you know. Like, uh, that's my lesson from those times, that the art is often not to make big radical demands. For example, take Greece today. They have a communist party, which is still a pretty strong one. Usually it gets between 5 and 10 percent. Now they lost. And it's the last big, as far as I know, Stalinist communist party. By Stalinist, I really mean Stalinist. They still reprint the collected works of Stalin, which is their sacred literature. And even, for example, their enemy is not uh, uh, Gorbachev. Their enemy is Khrushchev, who betrayed it by critics. And they said, no, Syriza is social democratic. No, let's wait. We want authentic revolution. And to be cynical, all right-wingers love them. Because they know that it's totally meaningless. They don't threaten anyone. Nothing changes. It's just a very comfortable position of sitting there in the back with your radical demands and so on and so on. You know, that's the tragedy. If you say we want communist revolution, it means nothing. If you just say like Varoufakis, let's renegotiate debts a little bit, everyone is in a panic. And that's what we should learn. And here we should be very specific to specific countries. For example, in the United States, universal health care triggers a process which you never know where it will end. We, in our countries, multiculturalism is a manipulated phrase. In Turkey, it means something, with Armenians, uh, Kurds, and so on and so on. Here I see an option, you know, because what I... I love movies, so... But we are very prominent members of this community. We broke all the discipline rules and everything, especially beginning with the time rule. So, you see, um, now I understand how I was in Poland. You're like Jaruzelski now. Of course, no? of course. Okay. However, Sorry, I stop. Yeah. However, okay. as for Jaruzelski, this was this part of the communist regime that already started to uh, uh, look uh, in certain dimension as what you hate Absolutely. in, in capo uh, capitalism, which is the cynical, yeah. uh, the cynical... I didn't have time, I totally agree. No, I will not talk again. But let but me confirm me, that's but, but, crucial how cynicism works today. I claim it's not only that ideology works, even if you don't take it seriously. Exactly. I'm ready to go a step further. I, you, it has to be not ta taken not seriously to work. We have this, and again, I know this from my youth in Yugoslavia. I know two friends who worked at the Central Committee in the 70s. They lost their job. One of them is Ivan Hvala, the other is my friend, they're not. Uh, why? Because they took self-management system seriously. They really believed in the system. And for nomenclatura, this was a horror. This was the first step towards this. This was exactly my point. That the biggest fear for the late communists was the, were the people who were really believed still in Marxism. Yeah. And immediately they, they, they expelled mm. them from party, or like at least they mm. isolated them somehow. Um, I actually, you know, there, there were so many questions asked to you, but I realized that maybe one uh, is or never or rarely, I don't believe that there is any question not already asked, but one cannot... Uh, and not already answered. Yeah. Um, that, um, but actually, the, the, I, I collected all the examples of those paradoxes oh, you. that you <laughs> that you invented, um, that, you, that you mentioned, like the one with uh, Syriza, uh, the one with uh, Fox News that actually is like a big fan no, of... I couldn't uh, believe it. But, but I think if you would like... Uh, no, sorry, can I just very briefly explain to you and you will immediately understand me. Very reasonably, the point was what really made them afraid, Fox, right-wingers, was. But in this way, we are pushing Greeks to Putin. No, no actually, this is the, the problem is that actually you can explain all those paradoxes pretty easily, giving the small answers, which, and the only disadvantage of the small answers is that they are not really spectacular. 
So like, give me know, an example. I can, I can actually answer to almost all of your paradoxes. Like why the, why the Western powers prefer, um, prefer new democracy so that people who are mm. responsible than Syriza because they think that Syriza is an even bigger danger. They why? Are, they are right. Why? Okay, but this is another discussion if they are right no, or not. not. Why? Why? But they are Syriza, extremely moderate social democracy. For you, but not for the people. Why? Why? Okay, I'm telling you what's No, the... it's not for me. It's not for me. It's by Western European standards of 40 years ago. It's extremely modest social democracy. Really modest. Like, they even now, uh, to give you the last proof, the latest news I have, they're not a priori against privatization. Actually, I'm not. It's the discussion about Syriza and uh, an agenda of yeah. Syriza. Yeah. This is one thing, but there is nothing paradoxical, actually, in the behavior of Western powers if in the ranking of the dangers, Syriza is in a higher position than the previous powers responsible. So actually, I don't see any. I also don't see anything really paradoxical in why Fox News is like a big fan of the left wing uh, um, or even Putin. Uh, actually, because behind this stays very coherent and exactly the same reason that they are anti-Americanists themselves. So anybody who actually is a, uh, uh, puts any pressure on the United States or like uh, or is a, or can harm in any sense the, the Western Alliance or whatever will be appreciated because an enemy of my enemies uh, is my friend, which is like very coherent logic. I mean, at least from the pragmatic point of view. So, um, and, uh, and also you said something which, uh, a lo lot of those paradoxes are based on the very Foucaultian point that, uh, like this, you know, uh, discipline and punishment. You said that, uh, so, so, so you said that, like about this, like the behavior in the capitalist countries yeah. or like this, the, the debt man. Yeah. I, I totally agree. This is exactly what happens. All my friends that are indebted, they will be a hostage of the mainstream. Yeah. They will always vote yeah. for the ruling yeah. party. And like, and it's even if they totally know that they're doing the thing against themselves. Yeah. Actually, this is something new in this late capitalism. Yeah. The yeah. fact that we know that we're doing something bad to us or, or generally, uh, and we do it still. This is, I mean, solving this question, how to how to overcome it, would be probably the the solving the question of but the left. But you didn't convince me. But let's go back. Okay, Foucaultian yeah. point would be easy. Yeah. I just I, I will I will answer you with a question. Like, if you really prefer the the previous solution, the, the control or the discipline, it's like to asking Foucault what he really prefers: torture of the state with the king. Or control with the kind with this with the like which is the advanced model of like economy society or whatever are you really sure that you're gonna choose the previous version of it without the control of capitalist country without the cynicism without all those okay. things that are this like is a complex question because I am one of the few madmen whom I know who is still for death penalty but this is another topic no I I, I think that now now you are too abstract in opposing in, uh, in uh, first when you say torture no uh, my god uh, it's today that torture is re-legalized you don't have to look into some dark past this is another uh, fine point of ethical regression that i want uh, are you afraid that the way even those who oppose torture the way we in the liberal west are talking about torture today is something that if you were to talk like this 30 years ago, you would be considered a totalitarian madman. You know what I mean? That even those who reject torture already accept it as a, as a topic of debate and argumentation. Like they say, but it's not really efficient. You cannot rely on... No, I'm here for total dogmatism. I think we should rehabilitate Dogma, progress of humanity is the more good dogmas you have, all the better. So that you will not think that I'm crazy, let me give you another example, Ray. Sorry, I wouldn't like to live in a society where you would have to argue all the time, you know, women really don't like to be raped or whatever. I would like to live in a society where you don't argue about this. Where if somebody starts with this bullshit, you know, uh, but women really secretly enjoy the enjoy it, he simply appears as a miserable idiot. You, 
La, you know, and it, again, it's easy to agree with this on rape. I would say the same about torture. But actually, it's, it's like what the difference between one uh, step of feminism and the second. Mm. First, you have to show the difference, then to, like overcome it and to mm. forget it in, act, in an active way. So like, uh, um, so this is why you have to like open the question of rape exactly to close it and then to put it as mm. a part of consensus which is behind the discussion. But I, again, I don't see anything paradoxical. Actually, I, 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 already, I also don't see anything paradoxical in this like Saudi Arabia example. Saudi Arabia is supported by the Western powers because this is the uh, one of the very uh, not too many solutions to control the region. Like Libya, for example, was, is something which may be a, 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 might be a big problem for your like order of exp or line of thought. No. Uh, no. Libya actually was uh, is a country that that was defeated like a dictatorship and created much uh, more horrible problem exactly for the people to yeah, but it's not Libya. only Libya Afghanistan is the same exactly, Iraq is exactly, the same exactly, exactly, I exactly. seriously claim that with regard to the position of women Iraq now is worse under than under Saddam and I have no sympathy for Saddam but whatever you say about Saddam this, he was, his regime was basically a secular regime with pretty important posts for women, education of women in his good years before he, and that's the problem with dictators, before he went crazy. But actually, these are the not easy questions, like would you really like to, like, I don't know, uh, uh, invade Saudi Arabia or like cut Saudi Arabia from any cooperation with Western powers? And what you get is for 80% the total mess in the, in the, or like the internal war, which as any civil war in uh, Islam countries, is totally bloody. The biggest victim of Islamism are Islam. Based on themselves, of course. I, no, I see your point and I'm here very, very pragmatic. I'm, I'm, the la I'm not a naive idiot who claims, you know, just give them democratic freedom and so on and so on. I'm just saying that, and this is not even a very original point, if you already return to this, the original scene is the end of World War I, when you had Lawrence of Arabia and all that bullshit, let's not idealize it, but you have a kind of a genuine movement among Arabs, and then I think that this, not even United States, it was mostly England and France when they cut it with this, to all, all states that we have now there are totally artificial. Afghanistan is artificial state, Pakistan is artificial state, and so on and so on. So all I'm saying is that the first thing to, I, I'm not proposing any, any easy solution, but if you ask me these two cases, Saddam and Gaddafi, n please, I, they will disgust me, and I know, Horrors, my friend told me, who were there as journalists. But I think it would have been much wiser. Now I will be cynical and I will say, especially from the Western interest, not to overthrow Saddam and uh, not to overthrow Saddam and uh, and uh, and Gaddafi. Look at Saddam. Listen. Uh, that's why United States practically supported Saddam, I think, if you ask me a step further. The but, original but you know scene then, of the West then, is... Then, then Slavoj Žižek or someone else would ex challenge this, uh, or like actually would, yeah. would, would say why West doesn't like invade Iraq or Saudi Arabia if there is like and so on. So like actually... No, I agree. This is a very complex topic. I agree. I, I agree. There are no easy solutions. Okay, so we, I, I understand that we should, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So. But what I'm saying is that, okay, let me put it like this, sorry. They are making the wrong invasions. Okay. Why, you know what I mean? They are as if they have an incredible instinct to make, the, well, look, uh, 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 the big fear of United States is Iran. They invaded Iraq. What's the result of this? That the main political force in today's Iraq is Iran who controls the Shia and so on and so on. It's just breathtaking. And, uh, but, but uh, sorry, to make an ad, no, I precisely, I'm, if you ask me, I'm pretty much a pessimist here. I think we live in a complex world where whatever you do is in a way wrong, but my counter argument to what uh, you said about Greece and so on, 
I'm not talking about justice here. I think that what Western Europe is doing now with Greece will be in the long term catastrophe for European Union itself. That's my very simple prediction. Okay. It will cut Europe into two, who knows what will happen. I think, or, or put it in this way, as an old dogmatic Marxist. You know, people say, oh, there is a, we, pretend, we think we are in democracy, but there is some secret uh, ruling class. I hope there would be, there is not. Europe, European rule political elite is more and more losing its ability to govern. And it worries me. Now, even if I don't have, uh, I should say, Klaus saved you from more of my questions. <laughs> and, uh, and let me uh, collect uh, how many I can negotiate with the organizers. Two, negotiate three with questions. Yourself. Yeah. Three? Three questions are okay. So uh, we have one and... Uh, and... Uh, okay, so let's go one after... Uh, but we'll do the it question. the Hegelian way. One okay. divides into two, and then you have synthesis. Oh, okay. Okay. You can yes, you yeah, yeah, you can of Deutsch auch sprechen, but also I can speak in English because I think there's a few people who maybe not understand German. First of all, Slavo SCJ, thank you very much for giving us such an, such an insight and vivid uh, inside view in the boiling mind of an international reputed philosophical pop star. And yeah. let me please only add, because what you did is was such a row and sh such a machine gun fire of arguments, of yeah, uh, memories, yeah. of uh, memories of what you read, of acquaintances, of people you told us you know and you met or whatever. So let me just add politely two, okay. two uh, things. But First of all, when you talk, to when you talk, wait, question, wait, wait, I come right? to the question. First of all, when you talked about Boko Haram and the ISIS, you could also have mentioned Opus Dei or maybe even the Vatican. No yes. problem. No okay. problem, of course. Secondly, this was such a cocktail, such a wonderful cocktail. Mm -hmm. But a cocktail, I guess. Yes, the a, point. Cocktail, yeah. a cocktail, a yeah. cocktail, and let me say it politely, a cocktail of platitudes from my point of view. And this was not easy to stand. It was uh, somehow, I really felt a little bit knocked out, but I want to say you very much and I want to finish in a few words of okay. Slovenia again, Kvala Lepa and Shiveli Tito. Thank you very much. And, and? Shiveli Tito. Because here you and yeah. now we come to the point. Yes, of course. Here, I give you the here argument. I of course, disagree. I know what I'm doing. Here yes, I yes. disagree. At you know, least. we have a big debate in Slovenia from nostalgic and so on. What was the war, the civil war in the early 90s? I think it was not because we betrayed Tito. I think all that was wrong, corrupted in Tito's Yugoslavia exploded there. I think that the war of the early 90s was that the ultimate cause was not even nationalism. It was the very simplified, the uh, Although I, I'm interested, could you elaborate that one? Sorry, so for me it was the survival of communist nomenclatura. This was the genius of Milosevic. He resuscitated nationalism, and in this way he legitimized the rule of old communist nomenclatura. But I wanted to ask you something else. Usually people say I have crazy, paradoxical, and so on. So uh, let's go through if what I said about Let's say what I said about how power functions today and so on and so on. If this is a platitude, in what sense platitude? That everybody knows it. I don't think everybody knows it. This permissivity and so on. I don't think everybody knows it. How is it with democracy? Freedom and everything. But, and you mentioned Marcuse, but please, please, politely, let me recommend you to you, before you yeah. again speak on freedom, reread only one book, and this is Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. A book to, to yeah, which of course, I'm yeah. totally opposed. Because I think it's a totally wrong diagnosis. No, sorry. Right. No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think that precisely Marcuse's one-dimensional man, you know where it misses the point? It is 
I know the book. This was the book of my youth. It, it, uh, how should I put it? Uh, it accept as a fact that capitalism will succeed basically as this uh, new one-dimensional society and so on and so on. I think the, he didn't see antagonisms of capitalism and so on and so on, not to mention the fact. First, so first, I think that as an analysis, socioeconomic is wrong, but especially, and every philosopher will tell you this, for example, the model of cheapest wrong Marxist, pseudo-Marxist criticism, the chapter against ordinary language philosophy, Austin and so on, Oh. Making fun of it, this is, this is how uh, theory we may be critical about late Wittgenstein and so on. But it's, uh, nonetheless, it was a tremendous revolution in philosophy, useful also for critique of ideology. Marcuse there, uh, not to mention, you oh. know what's for yeah, me yeah, with yeah. Marcuse wrong? Yeah. Or take his, for example. Now I will go even further in my platitudes if you want. Uh, when I see Eros and civilization, I claim, fuck it, maybe Goebbels was right, just in the wrong way. Maybe we should burn books, but just Goebbels had a good principle, but didn't burn the right books. This book is so totally worthless, this Freudo-Marxist idea, you know, sexual freedom, all the differences okay. disappear. No, hedonism is today in okay. power i think precisely topics which that's the horror of the 60s that all the big messages of the 60s sexual liberation and so on and so on were integrated into the ruling system and i'm ready to go to the end here today we should make hard work discipline that should be our mottos today i, I so again i i find it you know which I, I agree Samuel, with let's this. go to another so, question. Me, I'm one. Uh, Marcuse wrote one good book, Fernunt und Revolution, before World War II. Okay, okay. I mean, it's easy. I think it's easy, guys, to criticize Marcuse and a bit waste of time. But, uh, but there, is there any other question here on the audience? If not, then I will pose the last question uh, and uh, then I we go that. to the... No, but, but well, actually, something which bothers me is how you, by yourself, um, of course, considering also your some of yeah. your arguments, distinguish between the radicalism, which is very useful to satirize the left-wing positions, yeah. and the radicalism which is efficient politically. Which? This, huh? Which? Show me one radicalism. No, no, I, I am for it, but what no, do you I mean? Have, I, and well, it's actually there are too many examples of uh, like left-wing uh, intellectuals or like you know circles, movements, whatever that uh, are very useful for the mainstream to satirize the left at all. Because like, um, um, I don't think that do you really need a reason or do you need, a, need an example? Uh, yeah, you mean the like how yeah, to yeah. how to distinguish between radical like political radicalism and anti-political radicalism? To put it this way. I, I just cannot locate uh, the, the terms here. I am for radicalism. I, I'm just saying that sometimes to be truly radical is to insist on a tiny small point which may appear nothing, but if you press on that point, you trigger, you trigger a process. But you know what's the problem? Maybe I should conclude with this, really. Uh, you know, what I... I hate, although sometimes we have to use this term, I hate the left which tries to reinvent itself as democratic socialism, like PDF and so on. I'm neither a democrat nor a socialist. Why? First, socialism. I hate the term. Why? Because it's just, it means today just, no, we are not the bad communist totalitarians and so on. Socialism is something that everyone is ready to accept. Your compatriot, Otto Weininger, put it nicely, and of course I turn it around when he said socialism is Aryan, communism is Jewish. Yes, I'm for communism. In other words, socialism is just a, a general motto for we shouldn't be too egotist, we should think about it. Everybody can be a socialist. It's meaningless. I'm for communism. Of course, not for the 20th century, but whatever. Second thing, democracy. I don't despise it. It has its mega authentic moments. 
But nonetheless, I think that literally, quite literally, democracy is our fetish. Fetish in the sense that strict Freudian sense, you know, Freud says fetish is the last object you see before you see that woman has no penis, whatever. The la so in what sense does this work? This ca castration, woman, no penis would be vaguely a social antagonism. And I think the democracy functions how here. The model are two American films that I really hate, and I would put them on that Goebbels list to be burned. All the President's Men and Pelican Brief. They appear very critical. Hollywood left. Oh my God, the whole American state is corrupted, you know, and even uh, uh, the president is corrupted. Why then, when you finish watching that film, do you feel so good? Because the message is, look, and now I'm talking about all the president's men. We live in such a great society that you see two ordinary guys, journalists, can overthrow the mightiest men in the world. Isn't this a great country? You know, this is democracy as a fetish. It's yeah, 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 antagonisms, but we have democracy, we can be calm and so on and so on. No, I think that, I think that uh, democracy should be safe, of course, but it's a problem today. Everybody knows who is honest that in order to confront what we are facing today, new forms of racism, new forms of apartheid, ecology, biogenetics, whatever, uh, uh, the existing form of democracy is not strong enough. That's all I'm saying. And I, I'm here a radical pessimist. I'm not technically not saying back to a Leninist party. I'm well aware that it was much worse. I'm just saying that, well, Again, they, we don't even have mechanisms to cope with this. Just imagine, I recently spoke with a friend of mine from Japan.